Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barton, Washington. Today's Wednesday, March 29. And here are some of the stories we are covering. Vice President Kamala Harris concludes her three-day visit to Ghana today, Wednesday. This morning, she had the opportunity to speak to thousands of young people drawn from various institutions here in Ghana who had come to the Independence Arch to hear her speak about the role of uh, young people in the future of uh, Ghana and Africa. We also hear the views of some Ghanaians on the visit of Vice President Kamala Harris to their country. We have a discussion with the author of an unauthorized biography of Liberian President George Weah. A human rights activist shares his views on the release of Paul Rusese Bagina from a Rwandan prison. Guinea's military government denies human rights violations. Amnesty International paints a worrying state of human rights in Southern Africa. Violent crime continues to plague South Africa and the right to life and security of the person enshrined in the Constitution as well as in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is violated daily. And Mozambique begins massive post-cyclone cholera vaccination drive. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. President Kamala Harris concludes her three-day visit to Ghana today, Wednesday, with a roundtable of women entrepreneurs to discuss economic empowerment and leadership. On Wednesday, she will travel to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, the second leg of a three-nation Africa visit. Yesterday, Tuesday, the vice president delivered a speech at the Black State Gate, a monument built on the site where Ghana declared its independence in 1957, and she also visited Ghana's Cape Coast. Ghana's Information Minister Kojo Opong Nkrumah shares with us some details about Vice President Harris's trip, beginning with her meeting with President Nana Akufuado. The meeting focused primarily on how to deepen economic relations between the U.S. and Ghana, starting from Ghana's current efforts to consolidate the stability agenda and the role that the U.S. can play in assisting you know, Ghana to achieve that. And then on the other hand, the meeting also focused on security, how the U.S. and Ghana could work together to deepen the security agenda in the West Africa subregion and across the continent as well. Minister, you mentioned the issue of security. President Nana Kufuado, in his speech on Monday, talked about insecurity in the northern part of Ghana from Al Qaeda. What can you tell us about the threat of Islamic insurgents to Ghana and to the West Africa region as a whole? So, to be clear, the president did not speak about. Al Qaeda operations in the northern part of Ghana. No, he spoke about the threat of insecurity and even some reports of uh, insurgent groups in Burkina Faso, which is a country that borders Ghana to the north. So it's not within Ghana, it is rather after our northern borders into the country of Burkina Faso. And on that, Ghana and a number of West African countries have rolled out what we call the Accra Initiative that has been focused on helping to share intelligence and to assist the governments of various countries to deepen the anti-terrorism efforts that are made in these countries. And it's in that context that the president referred to the development beyond our northern borders. The American side, led by the U.S. Vice President, also committed that they will be supportive of Ghana's efforts in terms of logistics and technical support. Vice President Harris was to speak to young people on Tuesday. So, uh, Minister, what can you tell us about the youth of Ghana? This morning, she had the opportunity to speak to thousands of young people uh, drawn from various institutions here in Ghana who had come to the Independence Arch to hear her speak about the role of uh, young people in the future of um, Ghana and Africa. I interacted with a lot of the young people who were very enthused and inspired by the thoughts that she shared with them and who are in various ways doing a number of things to help be part of the solution to the various challenges around us. And I thought that it was a very inspiring moment for many. As I speak to you, she's on her way to the slave castle in Cape Coast, where she will get to experience for herself what many of the forebears of our brothers and sisters in the diaspora went through, a very dehumanizing and tragic experience. We believe that it will also be a spiritual experience for her, as she delves within herself and connects uh, with people from all over the world who have suffered uh, some sort of indignity. Before I let you go, uh, Minister, the Vice President uh, promised uh, increased uh, U.S. investment uh, to Ghana. Uh, What does that mean for Ghana in light of your country's current economic situation? Ghana is a country that helps itself a lot. 
but also we collaborate a lot with many countries all over the world. We're happy that our American brothers and sisters are joining us in this enterprise. It will go a long way to be a wind in our sail as we work to reboot the Ghanaian economy. Minister, thank you so much again. A pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much, James. That was Ghana's Information Minister Kojo Opong Nkrumah speaking with us from the capital, Accra. Some Ghanaians have also been expressing their views about Vice President Kamala Harris's visit to their country. I believe the Vice President of United States of America's visit to Ghana would help us strengthen our bond with the United States of America and also put us out there on the map would bring so much attention to us in such a way that other developing countries would also like to get into trading with us and then also those who are more like allies with the U.S. would also want to show interest in us in other forms. So security-wise, I feel they would help us Yes, so in case, I'm not saying, in case there is any form of attack on us, we can actually rely on them to defend us. I personally believe that Kamala Harris's visit to Ghana is very important because looking at the purpose behind the visit, it is to, you know, promote um, security and stability in African countries. You know, more recently we've heard of violent groups and you know, people forming groups to fight the government and then to kidnap people and all of that, you know, all those kind of insecurity and instability doesn't help the development of a nation. So the visit is actually on a good course. And then with a donation of $100 million to Ghana, I think it's, it's also a form of, you know, helping promote security and development. And we all know that if a country is unstable or it has a lot of, you know, insecurities, it drives away investment and other forms of, you know, you know, things like tourism and then people coming into the country to invest and all that. The views of some Ghanaians about the visit of U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris to their country. The new report by Amnesty International on the state of world human rights paints a grim picture of conditions in Southern Africa. Repression of freedom of assembly, expression and protest top the list of human rights abuses in several countries. Gender-based violence and the undermining of rights of the LGBTQ community also showed an increase in some countries. Tuso Kumalo reports from Johannesburg. Delivered at a press conference Monday, the Amnesty International report reveals that an armed group calling itself Al-Shabaab in Mozambique continues to behead civilians, abduct women and girls, as well as looting and burning villages. Tigere Chakuta, Amnesty International Interim Regional Director for East and Southern Africa, told the media in Johannesburg that the activities of the group have triggered a crisis. The situation has not received the attention that it deserves. This is a forgotten crisis in the region, really. There is a huge humanitarian crisis at the moment and human rights crisis. And still, human rights actors, the media, are not able to access Cabo Delgado. And that is a huge issue that we continue to focus on. The report also shows that there has been little reform in Zimbabwe since the exit of the late former president Robert Mugabe. Activists, as well as supporters and leaders of the opposition, continue to undergo harassment, arbitrary arrest, detention, torture, and imprisonment without trial. Bungai Chikwanda is Amnesty International's Interim Deputy Regional Director. She spoke to the briefing about the detention of Citizens Coalition for Change Member of Parliament and Vice Chairperson Job Sikala as one of many examples of state abuse. Sikala has been in prison since June. The fact that uh, Job Sikala has not been convicted of any crime is worrying. What we have seen is obviously a, a pattern of a clampdown on uh, journalists, on any opposing force, on anyone who expresses any form of dissent. Shanila Mohammed, executive director of Amnesty International, says South Africa is also on the wrong side of human rights.
Violent crime continues to plague South Africa and the right to life and security of the person enshrined in the Constitution as well as in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is violated daily with murder rates soaring as well as mass shootings, femicides and assassinations continuing unabated. Eswatini has also been cited for a growing government crackdown on activists, the abduction of opponents and the recent murder of human rights lawyer Tulan Masego. Gender-based violence and the infringement of the rights of the LGBTQ community are also dark spots in some countries, including Zambia. With countries like Zimbabwe, known for election violence, set to go to the polls this year, the organization is calling on governments to stop silencing peaceful dissent and allow journalists and human rights defenders to do their work. On the other hand, Zimbabwean President Emerson Nangagwa has denounced allegations of human rights abuses as divisive falsehoods. The government spokesperson for Eswatini, Elfias Numalo, has also denied the involvement of authorities in human rights violations, including the shooting of human rights lawyer Tulan Masego. Reporting for VOA News in Johannesburg, I am Tuso Kumalo. Partner in a report issued last week accused the military junta in Guinea of committing serious human rights violations. The study cited assassinations, arbitrary arrests, and the prolonged detention of opposition supporters, civil society leaders, and members of the former regime. Guinea's Minister of Justice and Human Rights describes the report as biased and says the military government respects everyone's human rights. Journalist Karim Kamara has more from Kunakri. The report of Guinea of the U.S. State Department urges the junta to do more to improve human rights. The report denounces continued detention without trial of opposition supporters and former government officials. It also criticizes arbitrary arrests of leaders of civil society groups and describes the Guinean justice as partial. The Minister of Justice and Human Rights, Alphonse Jasright, describes the report as biased and unfounded. He says as far as he is concerned, the report is based on unconfirmed information collected from local rights organizations that are politically affiliated. He says that they are denouncing things that have nothing to do with reality. He says report must be impartial and neutral. He adds that there is a net improvement today in human rights as compared to previous years. The minister says his office has put a stop to prolonged detention in Guinea and that there are no political detainees in the country. He says those called political detainees in the report are people who committed common crimes who must face justice. But local NGO says the report was credible. Mamadou Kali Jalo is a member of the NGO called Democracy Without Violence. It salutes the report and calls on the minister to accept its findings. Close to 20 opposition supporters have been killed since the junta seized power in a coup that overthrew the democratically elected president Alpha Conde in 2021. Key opposition supporters, members of civil society, are still languishing in prison after they were arrested for a number of alleged offenses ranging from economic crimes to violating bans on demonstrations in Guinea. Mohamed Touré, who is a student, describes the report as a true weapon. He says the mask on the face of the junta has dropped. He says the reports reflect reality on the ground. He says U.S. State Department should do more. Alfred Bangura is calling on the U.S. government to impose sanctions on Guinea. He says the United States should impose sanctions on the junta. He says the military are the ones who are shooting and killing demonstrators. He says the Minister of Justice and Human Rights is failing to fault the junta which is committing human rights violations. The Minister of Justice and Human Rights says his office is open for discussions about human rights with any person or institutions. Reporting for VOA Africa, I am Karim Kamara in Conakry. Liberian journalist and author Rodney Sears says his new book about President George Weir could not have come at a more appropriate time, especially as the country prepares for presidential elections in October. Sia, who is publisher and editor-in-chief of Front Page Africa, Liberia's biggest selling independent newspaper, has just published his latest book entitled George Weir, The Story of Africa's Footballer President, an Unauthorized Biography. 
Even though, President, we are declined to be interviewed for the book, Sia says he did his best to write an objective portrayal of the president by talking to Wea's closest football and political friends. Sia tells me that the book will give Liberians a true sense of who their president was before he became president and who he is now as president. I am back on this journey uh, about five years ago. One of the first things I decided to do was to make sure that I approached the president about it. I sent a text message on WhatsApp, and I said, um, I'm interested in doing a book about you. Would you be willing to do an interview? And he said, um, I'm not ready to tell my story. And I felt like the story is intriguing. He's a president, he's a public figure, and I thought it would be best if I continue this project because it was an important project, not just for him, but for Liberia. So I embarked on a journey where I interviewed two to three hundred persons close to him. They told me things they knew about him in the past, in the present. I interviewed the vice president, Jewel Howard Taylor, his former presidential candidate, uh, Winston Tupman, uh, former colleagues, former peers. I went to Cameroon, I went to Europe and other places to get a sense of, you know, who this man is. And that's why I think the book is important because despite him not being involved, I did my best to make sure that it was a very objective project. That's a very important point you just made because uh, in my conversation with people surrounding the president, in fact, one of them commented to me that uh, your book is not a true reflection of President George Weir. You are telling me that you made an attempt to talk to the president. Yes, I did. And in Liberia, we had this thing that because someone in public office do not give you access to them, it means you shouldn't write a book about them. But when you rise to the level of a presidency, everything is off limits. And as a journalist who covered George Weah as a footballer, now as a president, I think uh, this book is needed for Liberia, especially going into the uh, elections in October. I thought it was important to have a sense of this president, of who he is, where he came from, and really present the picture that Liberians will get to know him better. You mentioned, Rodney, Liberia going into the election in October this year. George Weah, the president, was a successful footballer, international footballer. What did you find in your book? Did his success as a footballer translate into success as president of Liberia? Well, um, the book tries to draw lines between the good, the bad, and the ugly. And most of the things that we see now as president, George Weir, some of the people I interviewed about the book saw those things when he was playing football, when he was captain for the national team, and those things uh, were things that some of the people, like Winston Tupman, for example, uh, gave a real good portrayal of what it was when Weir was his vice presidential candidate, how it was the campaign trail, some of the challenges they faced with him, some of the difficulties they faced with him. Those questions are, I thought were important to answer in this book, because so many times people forget to tell the whole story. And this book, in my belief, does that. And I think it answers lots of questions that people will be wondering about, about the president, uh, things that he, he may be doing now, questions answered about how is he doing it, why is he doing it. It goes back to his early beginnings. And as football captain for the national team, as head of you know, his peers during the days when he was in his prime. You had your first international lunch in London, and now you are about to launch this week in Washington, D.C. Uh, what has been the public reaction to the book so far? The reception has been very good. We're currently uh, number one African publication on Amazon, um, which is a very good thing for a writer to be proud of. There have been mixed reactions. Uh, some people think the book is against the president. Some people think it's in favor of the president. But in my whole life, that's how it's been. People try to figure out which side you're on. But I think once you balance things out, you tell both sides of the story, you keep the readers guessing, and that's important. It shows that you're doing something good. Rodney, thank you very much. Our pleasure speaking with you, and congratulations for your new book, George Weir, The Story of Africa's Footballer President, an unauthorized biography. Congratulations. Thank you, James. Rodney Sia is the editor-in-chief and publisher of Liberia's front-page Africa newspaper and author of George Weir, The Story of Africa's Footballer President, an unauthorized biography. He was speaking with me from Washington, D.C. 
the man portrayed as a hero in the film Hotel Rwanda has arrived in Qatar after being freed from prison last week in the East African country. Paul Rusasebagina is heading to Texas to rejoin his family, according to the Associated Press. Rwandan authorities sentenced him in 2021 to 25 years in prison for his ties to the National Liberation Forces, the FLN, the armed wing of a political group. The FLN launched a series of deadly attacks in Rwanda near the Burundi border. Human Rights Watch researcher Louis March, who worked in Rwanda for several years before being kicked out, tells viewers Carol Van Dam that Rusese Bagina admitted being tied to the FLN. But he very much publicly expressed allegiance to the FLN, and he used, in all three languages, French, English, and in Ken Rwanda, he used a very contentious phrase, which was basically, and I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, we need to change power in Kigali by any means necessary. And so I think that was really, uh, for the government of Rwanda, the sort of smoking gun in their case. And, uh, you know, this was a deeply flawed trial in many ways for us at Human Rights Watch. Um, but we've stated publicly uh, from the get-go that Rusesa Begina absolutely did say these things, and this was the crux of the government's case against him. He says he was jailed for criticizing the president. The government denies that it cracked down on dissent or carried out extrajudicial killings during that time. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, well, Rusesa Begina claims he was criticizing the president. Um, let me say this. People cannot criticize the president in Rwanda, and extrajudicial executions absolutely happen in Rwanda and happened during the time of Rusesa Begina's detention. But I would say that Rusesa Begina was not only detained for criticizing the president because he did pretty overtly come out in support of an armed group that did carry out attacks in 2018, which resulted in civilians being killed. Now, was he coordinating those attacks? I, 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 I do not know, and I don't put much credit in some of the um, evidence the government was presenting. But I would say that it is true that the government does jail critics, and it is true that extrajudicial executions and torture are commonplace against people either who are real opponents or perceived opponents. But I would say it's also true that Rosissa Begina's detention was not merely tied to him being a critic of the government. Are those kinds of things, those kinds of activities, extrajudicial killings still happening now? Oh, absolutely. The human rights abuses in Rwanda are not tied to Rasissa Begina only. These are uh, human rights abuses, including holding military, uh, holding civilians in military detention, torture. Uh, these killings, uh, these happened well before Rasissa Begina's arrest, uh, and they continue to happen well after. That was Louis March, a researcher with Human Rights Watch. He was speaking with my colleague Carol Van Dam from the U.S. state of Vermont. Health officials in Mozambique are set to hold a massive cholera vaccination campaign in Kwelemani, a city hit hard by Cyclone Friday earlier this month. Charles Maguiro reports from Maputo, Mozambique. The director of health in Zambezia province, Blayton Caetano, told State Radio Tuesday that the two-week vaccination drive is aimed at bringing down the souring number of cholera cases in the aftermath of the historic storm. Kilimani suffered significant damage when long-running Cyclone Freddy passed over Mozambique a second time this month, killing 19 people in all and forcing 50,000 others into temporary housing. Kaitano said that as a precaution, everyone in the city will be vaccinated. We are ready to start the vaccination campaign, and I think that in 24 or 48 hours, we will start a vaccination process for cholera with greater focus on the city of Kilimani. He says vaccination criteria is that all Kilimani residents, with or without cholera, including those of us in this room, we are going to vaccinate against cholera so that in two weeks, we can start registering the reduction of cholera cases. Charles Banguiro for VOA News, Maputo, Mozambique. And that's it for this Wednesday, March 29th edition of Daybreak Africa. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa crew, I am James Botting, Washington, wishing you will have a wonderful day.